Before I formed you in the womb, I chose you. Before you were born, I dedicated you. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. In the name of the living God, amen. Please be seated. We are awash in words. Hundreds of thousands of words surround us and swirl around us and in us and through us each day. So many words that in our ears and our minds it can all just become kind of a dull hum. Even sermons. (laughs) Sometimes especially sermons. We are awash in words. So many words that too often, the really extraordinary words, I am talking about the words that have the power to change our lives, they just blow right past us. So just for a moment, I invite you to to close your eyes or or do whatever it is that you do when you really want to listen and and focus. Because I'm going to say some words that we've already heard twice today, they're words that I'm not sure we really heard because they're so easily lost in the hum. These are words that have the power to change our lives. And as you hear them, know that they are God's word for you. You ready? Before I formed you in the womb, I chose you. Before you were born, I dedicated you. Okay. You know what those words mean? They mean that you... You are chosen by God. You, you are adored by God. You always have been. You always will be. These words mean God's choosing you. God's loving you is not because of anything that you have accomplished. It's not because of any degree or job you have or a a grade you get in a class or any good you have done or wealth you have accumulated. God chooses you. God loves you, not because of your respectability or grace, your appearance or eloquence, not because of how hard you can work or how much money you can give or even how much fun you are to be around. God chose you. God loved you before any of that. God loved you before you were even a thought. And God will love you long after your body has passed into dust. Hear those words. Think about those words. And really, 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 even if it is just for a moment, try to trust those words. Since before you even had an ear to hear and long after your breath has been stilled, every moment of every hour of every day of every year, God is holding you, gazing on you, smiling and singing like a mother to her infant child these three words to you. I love you. One of the many joys of working with Sally Howard is that I learned so much from her, not just about the priesthood, but about how the human mind and psyche work. And as a group, a group of us were meeting earlier this week talk, talking about these scriptures and, and how they intersect the life of this community, Sally reminded us that part of being human is that every one of us needs a secure identity to thrive and survive. Even that little one there. And whatever our identity is rooted in, 
is what we will cling to and defend. Whatever our identity is rooted in is therefore what we most fear to lose. So if our identity is rooted in something we can lose, we're going to do everything we can to make sure that we don't lose it. So to the degree that my identity, my sense of goodness and lovability is rooted in everyone liking me or in maintaining a certain image from whatever respect is left being associated with being rector of All Saints Church, I will do everything I can to make sure everyone likes me or to protect that image. That becomes my God. And it's not just about us as individuals. Communities have identities too. And so to to the degree that our identity, our sense of goodness and lovability as All Saints Church is rooted in people liking and speaking well of us or in an image that we're able to project to ourselves and to others, we're going to do everything that we can as a community to protect that. And that becomes our God. This is nothing unique to me or you or All Saints Church. It is just simply how all of us are wired as human beings. And so it raises the crucial question for each of us and for all of us, in what, in who, is our identity rooted? What do we value? What will we defend over all else? What will we cling to as if our life depends on it Because in a very real way, we believe that it does. If our identity is rooted in something that can be taken away, we will always, always live and act in fear of that happening. And that means there will always be limits to what we can do and who we can be. And that's a really big problem for us. Because remember the words? We get thousands of messages a day trying to tell us that our identity is rooted in stuff that can be taken away, in how we look or how hard we work or how many likes we get on Facebook or any number of things that we have to work to maintain or that might even be beyond our control. And whatever those things are, they become our God. Because our sense of goodness and lovability, our identity, man, it is like oxygen. And when it starts to slip away and we start to gasp, fear kicks in and we will do anything to bring it back. And if our identity is rooted in what can never be taken away, then we can be free. Our identity is securely rooted in what never can be taken away. There are absolutely no limits to what we can do and who we can be. And that's why God is whispering in your ear, in our ear, every moment of every hour of every day of our lives, before I formed you in the womb, I chose you. Before you were even born, I dedicated you. I love you. I love you. I love you. And I am never, 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 ever going to stop. Now God says these words to Jeremiah, and God says them to us as both reminder and prelude. You see, God was calling Jeremiah to do something extraordinary. God was calling Jeremiah to risk everything, to step out and proclaim truths of love and justice that the world in its fear would really not want to hear and in fact would react violently against. And God knew that if Jeremiah was to do this, if Jeremiah's life was to be extraordinary and free, Jeremiah needed truly to hear and to trust that his identity, his goodness, his lovability was rooted in the only thing that could never be taken away. And so before God called Jeremiah and said, I appoint you as prophet to the nations, what a job description that is. God says, hey, Jeremiah, 
Before I formed you in the womb, I chose you. Before you were born, I dedicated you. I love you. I love you. I love you. And Jeremiah heard those words, but I got to tell you, those words are so hard to believe. And Jeremiah is human, and so Jeremiah hesitated at first. He probably looked around, are you talking to me? Because that can't be me, God. I I can't even speak. I'm too young. And God, infinitely patient, said, my beloved child, try again. Listen again. You are worthy. You are capable. You are good enough and more just as you are. And all you need to do of all the words you have heard, is just to trust three of them. I love you. And then something absolutely incredible happened. Jeremiah trusted. And Jeremiah let himself be sent out into communities of other people that God loved desperately to proclaim and receive words of hope, power, justice, and love. Jeremiah trusted that God has always and will always love him, and that identity as beloved of God gave him the courage to love in extraordinary ways. Now, none of this is easy. I know I am so tempted to believe that my identity, goodness, and lovability are rooted in how others see me, how likable I am, my ability to please people and keep them happy, and a million other things. I deeply need to remember that the love of God is all I ever need and that I'm never going to lose it. I forget it so often that I continually have to remind myself. I continually have to stop, and I do it a hundred times a day and remind myself, okay, Kinman, God, you love me. You have always loved me, and no matter what happens in this meeting, in this conversation, or preaching this sermon, you're still going to love me when it's over. God, just help me remember your love and let it give me the courage I need to hear and to speak and to act on your truth in love. And I got to tell you, each time that I remember, I am a little more free. Each time I remember, I open the door just a little bit more for amazing things to happen. Now, Jeremiah was a much quicker study than me. He jumped right in. He tr- or at least that's the part we write about. He trusted in that perfect love that cast out fear. And that identity as beloved of God gave him the courage to let God make his life extraordinary. Now, we hear a different reaction to that love in the gospel readings from last Sunday and this Sunday. If you remember, Jesus is at his home synagogue in Nazareth, and he is giving people basically the same message, that their lives can be extraordinary, that God adores them and is giving them a word through Jesus that is a word of love and transformation that's just too good to keep to themselves, but for them to take out to the margins, the oppressed to all who were cast out and considered unclean. God was inviting them to trust so deeply in God's love that they would be willing to risk everything else to spread that love, a love that casts out fear, a life that has no limits. But the synagogue at Nazareth, they did not have their identity, their sense of goodness and lovability rooted in God's eternal love. I don't know what it was rooted in, but it sure wasn't God's love. Maybe. It was rooted in the ability of their leaders to preach incredible sermons, which is why they marveled and took pride in the eloquence of Jesus' words. Maybe it was rooted in a sense of exceptionalism, of our synagogue is better than all the other synagogues. And that's why they hoped Jesus would would burnish that reputation. Whatever it was, the synagogue did not believe they were worthy, capable, good enough, and more just as they were. Their identity was rooted in something that they were deeply afraid to to lose because they had a very different answer than Jeremiah to God's call. They got angry. I mean, they got angry. They got, let's drag Jesus out of town and try to throw him off a cliff, angry. The kind of anger that made a preacher glad to be in the relatively flat Midwest for most of the past 20 years. 
Now, what we know about anger, and again, what I've been taught, is that anger is what is called a secondary emotion. If you dive deeper into anger, you will always find sadness, fear, or both. And that means the reaction of the people in the synagogue was just deeply human. I mean, this is textbook humanity. Jesus challenged their identity and security, and what? They were sad and terrified. And they reacted in anger not because they were bad people, but because they were really struggling. They just couldn't bring themselves to trust that they didn't need to look anywhere else for their identity, goodness, and lovability than the promise of the eternal love of God. This is nothing new. We've seen it over and over and over again. We've lived it over and over and over again. The reaction of the synagogue, that's why Bill, Bill Connor turned fire hoses on children in Alabama. It's why Nora Phillips and her lawyers from Al Otro Lado are being prohibited from getting to their clients in Mexico, and sometimes it's us. It is us whenever our identity is rooted in superiority and exceptionalism or anything else that can be taken away because we're human and we will react with anger rooted in fear and sadness to defend that lie that any of our goodness and lovability is rooted in anything else other than the love of God. Yeah. And we've seen the other side too. It gets better. We've seen it right here. All saints, we have an extraordinary past and an incredible present, not because we're better than anyone else. The greatness of this and any community lies in those times throughout the years unto today when we have been able to trust in love. And when that has happened, when we have believed in God's love for ourselves, when we have believed in it more than all the things we are and have that can be taken away, we have been able to go to places that the world called unclean and proclaim and receive God's love in ways that have been nothing short of transformative. And more than anything, that is the road that is always before us. Because that love that is for us, God's inclusive love for each of us and all of us, it never rests. Love abides and pushes forward and outward. And so every moment of every day of every year of our lives, over and over again, we just keep asking ourselves the question, individually and as a community of faith, will I, will you, will we be Jeremiah or the synagogue? Will I, will you, will we live in fear of losing what we have or how we are seen or, or live extraordinary lives of freedom, justice, and love that take us to those ragged edges of creation to meet and bear God's love in ways that we never could have imagined? Will I, will you, will we every moment of every hour, of every year of our lives, keep straining to hear and trust the words that God just keeps whispering over and over and over again in our ear. Words God longs for us to hear and believe. Before I formed you in the womb, I chose you. Before you were born, I dedicated you. I love you. I love you. I love you. Amen.